Um, just speak about um, what you think the, the impact of such an initiative will have on those, I guess, um, those, those people who were impacted by that pandemic and the vulnerable population. Okay. Um, thanks for asking this question. In fact, my, my comment this morning have to do with, in addition to the... Um, to the, to the um, $1,500 that would be um, given to, to more than to approximately 5,000 persons. Last week, we rolled out an additional $50,000 for the feeding um, program for persons around, people who are involved in feeding, like Feed the Poor, the churches, and what have you. So under that same program, income support, that we provided these individuals who are involved, the churches, Feed the Poor, and other. Um, NGOs, they, we distributed support totaling $50,000. That's in, that's in keeping with the, 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 um, the support under the COVID response. So yes, the, this, this is critical, very critical. To, um, and of course, I, I cannot help but to, to continue to ask persons to support these initiatives, support when we do these things for our vulnerable population. I know that there are times we take these things for granted. Um, it's easy to be, to, to be having a hard sleep. What I call a hard sleep means sleeping on concrete on the city. A simple depression um, in your life and on, you know, without taking medication, some problem can, can cause you to be on the streets. And to know that you have a society that will reach out to you in these difficult times, I think is very encouraging and we need to support this. Persons who lost their job and have not recovered, and even um, some of them are trying to get out, they know it is their responsibility to do better for themselves, and nobody owes them. But they are having a difficult time. So when they, we announced that they would be receiving $1,500 um, in the month of November, I mean, it's an excite. They, they are happy about it. They, 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 um, they are looking towards this thing with some more some hope they can they can take care of a few bills and start over some people just need to pay off a few, a few utility bills um, um, maybe to take care of the the, the internet bill and the, and the phone bill so that the children could get on to their their homework having their, their wi-fi in touch and what have you so the 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 homes that have been affected by COVID it has affected their capacity to respond to basic needs water electricity They're, these are challenging areas some of them have indicated that they will take care of some of those outstanding bills. So yes, this is very impactful, and I'm happy that more than you know, approximately 5,000 persons you know would be benefiting 5,000 households. Um, and and do not just think of it in terms of 5,000 persons, but when this um, gets into the home, and um, using the statistics in terms of 3.2 persons per household, you're really talking about almost 15. Um, thousand persons benefiting from an intervention like this and it's 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 good for the children going to school knowing that when i get home there's going to be wi-fi there's electricity uh, mommy has taken care of the water bill and water view they are they, they are resin whatever you and it it also affects the, the the atmosphere at home because when these when you do have these outstanding issues at home it affects families, it affects relationships, it, it contributes to a whole host of things and even lead to domestic violence. And we talk about gender-based violence. All of these are contributing factors. So yes, the support for uh, the, the income support is, is one that I support. And I think you need to add your voice, not just report it, but you have an opinion, you should, you should add your voice to it. And the $50,000 to feed in people on the, um, around the city and those involved, like feed the poor, I mean, I keep repeating his name, that's, that's Henry, but he's one that's out there. And the churches, who oh, the Seventh-day Adventist Community Services Group, um, the, the Catholic Church, um, um, the Salvation Army, they were all present in a, in a ceremony where we provided, provided them with the support. It's, it's tremendous. Um, it seemed like it's, um, for some people, what is $50,000 when you look at, if you consider that our our indigent, you know, it's about 1.8, you know, percent of our population. Um, but these people are meeting critical needs of those who are on the on the on the on the fringe of the city um, or, or, or sitting around, knowing that they will find a meal. It's, it's helping this. At the moment, they are they are applying online, and the the, the application is is thorough. 
would capture basic information and then when we close the period for application, then we will be doing the assessment. You know, so, so if you want to, you can apply if you believe you qualify. You will apply, okay, great, yes. Well, whether we can, uh, young man with disabilities was badly beaten. Um, I think the national organization for people with disabilities put out a statement. Um, speak to the importance of taking care of, of these people and more importantly, not taking advantage of, of persons like them. Yes, and, and um, I'm happy, that's a very, very important question that you've raised. The issue of gender-based violence, sometimes people tend to focus that it is really men, you know, and women, and, and, and women being the victim. But I think we, we in a society now where we, when you look at gender-based violence, we're talking about other vulnerable groups, the elderly, persons living with disability. And, and that, is, that is something that we, we need to have a discussion on, continue to discuss it, raise it as an issue. I heard the news. Um, it's unfortunate, you know, and my sympathy goes out to him. But it's an entire society. You have the organization for, for persons living with, with, with disabilities, and, um, and I know they're doing quite a bit of work. But our people, disabled people, live in communities, and they are family, they have friends. Until we can function as a community, in, in, in the real sense of what a community is, the organization responsible for persons with disability, or the government, or the police, will not be able to stop that sort of, that, that, that idea of hurting an individual who is vulnerable. You know, I, yesterday I had an opportunity to visit um, somebody, a young person who's, who's living with chronic disability and, um, and shared a smile with the person. And he's being cared by a family member. The person is, is, is at home all day and have to give up livelihood by just providing care um, for this individual. Um, such is the case for some families. And again, our support, our, our disability grant, the Prime Minister has made available, you know, funds where we have approximately um, 350 persons and an additional 100 on a waiting list receiving a support every month from this government, I think is something that your voice, you know, you need to add your voice and, and support this initiative. And when I ask, the Prime Minister has given more, but I, I tend to ask a lot more, you know, to reach out to persons. This, this kind of advocacy is critical. These are not political agendas. These are humanitarian um, activities, and it needs people who people who are, are concerned about ordinary people to add their voice to that kind of support. So I would, I would love to hear the media not just celebrating, but asking us to do a little more, get more resources to do more of that. Okay, I have not received the report from the, um, the officers from SSDF, but I'm aware of what's happening. Um, cabinet has approved the establishment of, of, of a, not a consortium, the word consortium was, was changed, but um, civil society and, and private sector coming together to lead this activity. Um, we've just started work where that is concerned. Um, we're expecting to roll out more in the new financial year interventions where we are targeting and to, to bring all, all efforts, all persons who are concerned about crime and violence and, and, and want to contribute to, towards St. Lucia being a safe and a better place and to save the lives of our young people, ex especially our young men, to be part of this consortium, working together. So Cabinet has approved this um, two, two Mondays ago and the work for this activity within the SSDF will roll out in, in, in a powerful way. You will be hearing and seeing a lot more of activities as it relates to this. Uh, just my final question. Um, earlier while we were speaking about the COVID-19 um, support, you spoke of, uh, to the challenge of people not being able to pay their bills. Um, I know that last year you were involved in some sort of conversations with Lucilek and Flo. I know at the time you had welcomed the $20 package, um, home package instituted by Flo. 
Um, how, are, how are those conversations progressing with those companies? And I guess what are your um, thoughts on you know, the ministry and flow working together to provide? Yes. Yes. The, yes, the bundle is working well. Um, it is the, a lot of the people who critically need it. They have, a, they have been taken care of, but there's still more persons who um, we are discussing with floor. For example, persons who are unable to pay the bill, not necessarily qualified, but we're revisiting, we, we're revisiting the policy as it relates to those who access it. So more than 50% more than of, of, of the, the of this 5,000, maybe 2,500 persons have accessed the flow bundle. So we have persons paying $20 monthly for, for a bundle, meaning they have internet, they have television at their home. Um, some persons do not have the means of, of connectivity. And remember, I, I spoke with um, Flo with regards to having, um, having modems that, that are solar driven. Um, I, I, again, because if you do not have electricity, you can't have internet. So that discussion, I'm, I'm having that discussion. It's ongoing with with um, with with flow. Also with flow select, the idea of having prepaid electricity has again posed. You know, it's a conversation that I'm having. The technology exists, and flow select has agreed to to look at the possibility of rolling it out so persons can purchase electricity in quantity that they can manage in advance and be able to sit on their phone or on some platform seeing that they have a balance of five dollars so they could go into a supermarket and top it up before they get disconnected um if this tech this close like has agreed to 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 come in this direction of course it's more pro poor approach in in consuming services like this and i i hope a day when we can we can have the technology to to bring basic services to our people providing options that they can consume one way or the other not everybody wants to have a meter um, and, 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 and consume as they wish and, and then come up with a large bill at, at the end of the month that they cannot pay. But if persons like most Dominicans I find do, they, they, they purchase electricity on the phone from the supermarket, they top up and then they, they, they manage a lot better. And you do not have the incidence of disconnection, of disconnecting electricity in Dominica like we have here. So I'm happy that Lucilek is considering this. Again, all of this is, is, is in a way try to, to create an environment for, for, for ordinary people to, to have access to services, respect their rights, and make living in the, in the, in, 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 on the island a lot easier. You know? So that would be done. Also, we would be speaking to, to cabinet with regards to looking at other annoyances in this in, in as persons provide services to people and find ways to resolve it one of the areas that for example persons live on family estate they do not own they live on family estate they have been there all their life and um, they want to have connection but they ask them for legal land people that they cannot come up with and that is affecting them get connected we are just looking at this as an area of trying to resolve with the, um, the service providers and other similar um, annoyances within this, the, 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 the whole um, gambit of, of services we provide to people, how it disadvantage or it affects um, poor people or vulnerable people that they're not able to easily access and, and, and have, it, have the connection done because of the issue of um, land um, and, and what have you. So we are looking at all of this in keeping with the support that we're providing under the COVID support and on our, our, under the resilience program that we have with the World Bank as well. Yes, yesterday we welcomed the first cruise ship, the Venezia. Um, just over 4,000 passengers uh, out of a total capacity of about 5,001 which probably says about 80% occupancy, um, which is actually higher than what we were projecting. Based on our projections on the number of calls for the year, we were expecting you know, about 630,000 or so. Um, it looks, if that level of occupancy remains, that we'll have closer to 700,000 arrivals for the year. We'll have 18 inaugural calls, which says quite a lot. Inaugural calls meaning it's the first time the ship is calling on St. Lucia. And I think last year we had about 10. Um, so it's going to increase 
this year. And we've not yet even started implementing the agreement with GPH, and we can already see our numbers rising. So hopefully um, you will see even better numbers um, you know, over the coming years. Of course, you recognize when you compare stayover visitors with cruise, the, the cruise will stay for one day, stayover would stay um, average seven days. But the cruise passengers, probably in a more direct way, affects everyday life in St. Lucia. The taxi drivers, the vendors, the sites, the attraction, the restaurants, the beaches, where the beach boys make a living. So the cruise has a significant impact on you know, our economy in an almost direct way. Uh, you know, every single day, thousands of people come to St. John and spend money. Money f flows immediately. Um, another feature of this year's season will be um, the increasing number of ships that will come during the summer. Because last year, again, a lot of noise that there were not enough ships. We tried to explain to them this was a comeback year from COVID. Um, some of the smaller ships that used to come no longer in operation, but we were working on getting more ships during the summer, the off season. And I think we will be getting a ship at least you know, every week during the off season. So um, we're very excited about that. We will continue to work to get even more ships to come. And we've already started a lot of intense work to get more yachts to come, because the yachts are also you know, an attractive source of spending for persons when they come into the country. So we're certainly looking forward to the cruise season, but it's more than the cruise season. It's also um, the peak tourism season. And some of the flights we were able to, to get um, back on, on track. Of course, I had explained that the summer was going to be a bit challenging as Europe opened, as the Far East opened, and that you know we would have some challenges. Some of the airlines were saying they did not have the equipment, nor did they have the crew for them to continue the level of service they had um, pre-COVID. Um, last year was an exceptional year. St. Lucia opened up very early, and some regions still had not been opened up yet, so we had quite a lot of flights. Um, but we are continuing to work. Over the next few days, the Tourism Authority, myself, will be attending Roots International, where all the international carriers are present and having discussions with all the major airlines to see what more we can bring on board for, for, for St. Lucia. So the next few days will be really critical for us in terms of our negotiations and discussions. St. Lucia is in a position where we don't pay um, minimum revenue guarantees, MRGs, for, plane, for flights to St. Lucia. We don't do so right now. Um, it's a practice that, that existed in the past where millions of dollars were paid, uh, which we don't do. Um, we do have joint marketing programs with some airlines, but we don't pay MRGs. And there are some people who are saying we should be paying millions of dollars to airlines to fly to St. Lucia. Um, we've not reached a point where we believe that's an imperative, and it must be done. So our policy position remains the same for now. Uh, Mr. Nessa, obviously you're expecting vendors, taxi drivers, and other individuals in the tourism sector to benefit from cruise visits. But from time to time, we hear vendors and even taxi drivers saying otherwise, that they don't really benefit from these visits. Your response to that? And also, can you tell me a bit about yesterday's romance? Yeah, so taxi drivers that carry cruise passengers saying they're not benefiting, but if they're carrying passengers, how are they not benefiting? Yeah, but how does it make sense? I mean, because if you are carrying passengers around the island, you are benefiting. But let me tell you, now that's an issue. So listen to this. Yesterday, we had a soft opening of the temporary area at the Monley Bay. As you know, the Monley Bay was compromised and it was an unsafe area. And we had to take the decision to physically dismantle it because we could not have a situation where there might be a disaster if persons continue to go there. And we developed this area, and you, I invite you to take a look at it. Um, virtually in one month, we really got it set up for the vendors, and our plan is to start the construction of a new lay-by. Mm -hmm. And we have some very exciting plans for that new lay-by. 
In preparing for, 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 the start, for this temporary structure, I had reason to say to the, the vendors that they really need to, to work on how it is you convert visitors coming in. Because they said the same thing to me. Minister, they have visitors coming, but you know, we, you know, as if we, we're not making money, we're not benefiting enough. And I had reason to say to them, okay, the first thing you need to do. I said, I have stopped on this lay-by many times, and I hear your conversations. I hear how you all speak to the visitors. I hear the things you all say to each other in front of the visitors. This is a professional enterprise. If you want people to buy from you, you have to be a sales person. You have to use sales techniques. You have to sell your product. You have to charm people. That's how people sell. So we said to them, look, we're going to do some training, and we did some training at the ministry for them. And the ministry has been doing training for vendors around the island because we recognize that's a problem around the island. So I was saying to them, look, we, pro we, bring, we make sure we go out, we market, we promote Selusha so the visitors can come to the island. We provide you with the facility. We are available to help you source items. The final step has to be yours. We've trained you, we've brought the visitors, we've helped you get the items, we've trained you. You have to be able to make the sale. We cannot make the sale, and we cannot force the visitors to buy from you. So we can understand you're saying, you know, you, you, it's a challenge, but maybe it's the time for you to rethink your sales strategy and your sales technique, and we will help you do so. And, and let's work together with the ministry for you to be able to better you know, sell the products that you have. But it, it has to be a clear understanding in your mind that you are a professional salesperson. Visitors who come to the, to the lay-by or any part of Sanusha is under no obligation to buy your items. They're not. So we will help you get the, the right facility and under the GPH agreement, we will entirely redo the vendor's arcade to really make it a more attractive, more conducive area. We will train you. If there are items you want to source, we will help you source it. But you two now need to um, take it across the line. And we want the vendors to see themselves as professionals. If it's just a pastime for us, it, it cannot be that. It, it has to be a professional engagement. The same way any salesperson goes about doing their business, see yourself in the same way. And, and that's the mindset we try to sell to them. So th there are people. Let me tell you, there are some taxi drivers in San Lucia. Visitors tell you they are the best in the world. The best in the world. The way they speak to them, the way they, they treat them, the stories they tell them when they drive them. They, want to, they, they virtually say, these are the only people I want to drive me when I come to San Lucia. But they also have some drivers that really need to step up too. So I, I think we need to raise the standard of service delivery. And not believe because you're a vendor, it has to be a vaiki vai kind of thing. You are professional. This is your livelihood. And therefore, what's needed? And the ministry is always available to work to improve on that, to make sure that that dollar filters down. And how was it? Oh, it was excellent. Um, I must tell you, last year was the first time we tried this, um, the Global Romance Summit, where we brought on travel agents who actually sell wedding packages. We brought on some media. And we brought down, we had the local service providers. And there were different days with different focus. Um, but last year, we tried an expo at Sanders Grand. And the space was already too small. And this year, we had it at Harbor Club. And even that space looked already too small. And when, when you see some of what our solutions um, presented, I mean, the travel agents, I mean, they said they saw why St. Lucia is the number one because not only the quality that's world class in terms of the infrastructure, the setting, the decor, the understanding of what's needed for a wedding, uh, but also to the, the people we have in St. Lucia are really um, oriented towards delivering a world class product. And a lot of travel agents said to me, what they love about St. Lucia is how the local service providers are always engaging in working with them, the partnerships and really creating what their clients want. And they were very, very impressed. And they, they could not, I mean, they, they just told me that they never expected that quality um, that Senusha. They heard about it, some of them. Some of them had experienced it, but to actually come and see 
the entire setup. And I don't know how many of you were there. I suspect some people because they heard weddings and they didn't want to. Yeah, they had bad news and, and they, they, didn't, they didn't show up. But um, I think next year we have to probably look for an even bigger venue because at the same time I got messages from some locals who said to me, hey, I didn't mind being there. Um, for example, some, I, I would have loved to see some videographers there and photographers there because these people want those services as well. Um, but it was really fantastic. And we had a fashion show, also showing off local design, wedding dresses and whatnot. Um, so it will get even bigger. This year was just the second year. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very sure by the fifth year of hosting this, it will become one of the Roman summits to go to in the world. Um, that's how I believe impactful it can become. But of course, we will grow year by year. Yeah, with the lay-by, can you explain us to, I, I, for myself and for other persons who've said why the lay-by was done so late? Can you give an explanation as to? Because some, for, for some people, we were not aware there was a, re a redevelopment of the lay-by. We were not aware. No. Well, we've put up signs telling people not to, not to go there. We've put up caution tape. We've put up all kinds of, um, you know, inhibitions or structures to prevent people from going there because we noticed that there was some instability. We, we, in the last year or so, we redesigned it um, and we applied for funding from an external agency for us to build a new one. And two weeks ago, we got word that it has been approved. So the funding has been approved um, for the new lay-by. Um, but yeah, we've been for the last year since we decided that we had to condemn it. We've been preparing for the transition. Um, we were still hoping that we could have done some remedial works on it and maybe keep it for another season. Um, but our hope is that we should start the new structure by January, which will be in the middle of the cruise season. Uh, if we want them to move in for the next cruise season, which is October next year, we have to start building by January. So we, we had to make a decision that it doesn't make sense to keep them there until March when the season ends, and then to, to start the new and miss next year. So we finally took a decision. In one month, what you see up there is basically one month forth. When we made that decision to just know, we need to break down, we need to start in January. So over the next couple of months, we will be preparing all the tender documents, all the financing agreements, and for us to hopefully get a contract and start by January, and by September complete it. Uh, the vendors to move in for October when the season starts. With October being the Creole Heritage Month, what are, are some of the ways that um, the government is working tactically um, to take advantage of that um, with, with tourists on island? Yeah, um, that's a good one. The last time I answer a question like that, I got myself in trouble with my friends in Dominica. So I, I'll be very careful um, because I boasted of what we can do with Creole Heritage Month, how big it can become. And somebody took the clip over and Dominic and said, but wait, yeah. <laughs> and, and put me in a lot of trouble with my friends. Um, but on a serious note, um, one, a major component of how we sell St. Lucia now is selling the people, the culture, the heritage, um, selling the vibe of St. Lucia, and Creole Heritage Man fits nicely into this. Traditionally, October is one of the lowest periods and the tourism calendar. So September, October, it goes down and starts to come back up in November. Um, so it's a low period for us. Um, there are a lot of ideas floating around as to how we can enhance you know, Creole Heritage Month. As it had been in the past, the heavy focus on Creole Heritage Month was on June Equiol. And you notice we have started since last year to broaden the programming more and more. Um, so FRC would have Jeune Creole Heritage Day, Jeune Creole, a uh, Wule Laba, and a couple of other activities. Now we try to encourage a full month of activities. And you would notice each of the host communities themselves have a full month of activities. So on the weekend, you had the river, Lime in the Valley, you had the La Magritte Seance by Falco, you had the cassava event. Um, so Buto had a Anduya Creole. So what we are doing now is building the product, building the product. When you build the product, you can now sell the product. So um, again, next year probably will be in a better place where we can say, look, we have a full program of activities for the month. 
so somebody can choose what part of the month they want to come to St. Lucia. The other way to use it is to for the, get the hotels, the accommodation sector, to incorporate Jeune Creole for the month. So persons say, look, I can go to St. Lucia and really experience a culturally authentic um, activity. So we, we are slowly building towards um, getting that kind of product where we can sell it as a critical part, well, an important part of our um, attractions. Also, um, I know that, well, recently, you, you guys won the big for Cricket World Cup next year. Mm -hmm. um, speak to the, the impact um, that you will have on tourism, and if you can give any additional um, details on it. Yeah. Well, first of all, cricket is more than just for us in this part of the world. Um, economic activity and even, well, tourism as well. Um, cricket is part of what defines us as a, as a people, and we've not been doing too well. Um, I mean, fr world, yeah, yeah, from my experiences in, in cricket, I, I, I tell you, cricket cannot revive in this region unless governments get more involved. I'm not saying to take over it, but provide more collateral support because the facilities, the programs, the, the boards cannot do it on their own. And you need to have a factory producing cricketers. Uh, and somebody has to help in making that happen. So hosting Cricket World Cup is more than just economic activity. It's also about contributing to the resuscitation of you know, West Indies cricket and improving the facilities that can make cricket get better. So in June, um, the Cricket World Cup will be hosted. We are told at the end of this World Cup that's going on now, um, they will release the, the schedule of matches. Um, so St. Lucia is hoping um, to get some of the premier matches. Now, if we get what we want, um, we believe it will drive tourism arrivals because of the team that we want. Um, if they, we do get that team, it, it will be significant. We believe um, we one of maybe two or three territories that can host, uh, say, an England participation in the World Cup um, in terms of the numbers of people that follow. And we have an ideal setup in St. Lucia. We have a, a template that works in terms of the, the facility, um, where it's located in the north, in the midst of all the hotels. No hotel in the north is more than 10, 15 minutes from the ground. Um, the entertainment spot at Grosley, Rodney Bay. Um, so it's ideally set up at, at, in St. Lucia for us to have a successful um, hosting. We've had Cricket World Cup 2007 and in 2010, we hosted semi-finals. Um, we may not necessarily be interested in the semi-finals now. We're probably looking for a different you know, configuration, but of course, we'll wait to hear what is being proposed to us. Um, but we'll be ready. It will take some resources because the Bosejo, for example, Bosejo Cricket Ground, the Darren Summit Cricket Ground, the outfield is 20 something, 20 odd years old. It was built in 2002. And we saw what happened during CPL. It rained, we could not get the field dry because the whole ground has to be dug up and redone. And the technology for outfields have even improved since then. So we need to upgrade it. The, the players' pavilion needs upgrading. Um, there are a lot more um, provisions you need to have in your dressing rooms. Um, so there, there, there's some upgrading. The practice facilities, Grosley has to be upgraded slightly. If you go to Mindo Philip Park, has to be upgraded. Um, Corinth is already being upgraded, and Corinth will be in tip-top shape um, for the World Cup. So, you know, pack and rides, for example, we need to sit down and redesign how we're going to do pack and rides. We also need it for jazz, and jazz is the month before Cricket World Cup. So, you know, we need to, at least we get a chance to try out some of the, you know, systems for, um, for jazz. And very soon we'll be making some announcements on jazz, so look out for those announcements. I can't tell you who's the feature act yet, but... Uh, no, not yeah. um, you mentioned all of those pr provisions. There's also the outstanding issue of the Rodney Bay High stretch of route there. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine would need some sort of remedial work to facilitate the volume of traffic that's anticipated. Yeah, I, there'll be a, a team looking looking at that. Um, I don't know how much more can do can be done between now and June, but like you say, certain alterations may have to be made. Um, so very soon we'll be moving into Top Gear, in terms of you know the arrangement. So we have Jazz in May, World Cup in June, Carnival in July, and you know this weekend we launch um, Carnival in Miami. When we did it last year, we were the only country, and then I guess. 
others saw how successful it was. So we had a lot of competition this year of other countries wanting to launch <laughs> in Miami as well. Um, so again, we have to now thinking of what's the new way of doing it because constantly you have to change your game because everybody else is competing with you. And so we did launch, our global launch of Carnival was in Miami on Thursday last week. Um, and therefore in July we'll have Carnival. In August we will have Emancipation Month and of course October next year Creole Heritage Month and um, certainly it will continue to grow. So we're going to have a very exciting year next year. I'm going to ask you the hardest question. No offense, colleagues. You, every now and again, you'll get conversation and talk about the dependency on tourism. No matter who is which government is in power, but there's a dependency on tourism. So perhaps there's a section of our society who probably don't understand or appreciate the contribution of tourism. It's basically the fuel for our economy. Can you explain, if you can, um, why tourism is as important as it is to our economy? And what, what is there any scenario where there's another sub-productive sector that could equip what tourism or replicate what tourism does for our, our economy? Well, I, I think um, the only industry we have in St. Lucia that has a competitive advantage globally is tourism. Plain and simple. Only industry. And simply because we offer a service and a product that the more industrialized countries cannot replicate as yet. They've not been able to invent a beach in Germany or in France like ours. They've not been able to replicate the landscape we have. They have their own. We have our own. They have not been able to replicate the kind of vibe we have, the joie de vivre we have, the culture that we have. They've not been able to do so. So tourism, um, and they have their own tourism. I'm not suggesting Paris is the most visited city in the world. So they have their tourism. But we have ours. And ours, you know, is, is, is you know, of, a, of a special nature. When it comes to manufacturing, to agriculture, we cannot compete with them. That, that's the reality. The challenge we've had as a, as a government, and as a party, the Labour Party, is that we want more St. Lucians to benefit from tourism. So whenever we've been in government, we've always tried to create um, a paradigm, to create an understanding of tourism to make sure St. Lucians can have greater benefit from the tourism industry. And even now, we keep saying, we want more St. Lucians to participate in the tourism industry, and we want more St. Lucians to own the tourism industry. And like I've said to people, when you look at the rivers, the waterfalls, the mountains, the beaches, the people, the culture, that belongs to the people of St. Lucia. So the, the assets we have that's driving a billion dollar industry, we should own more of it. We should, as a people, we should own more of it. We should participate more in it. We should get greater benefit from it. So directly now to your question, you know, people say tourism is so fickle, so... Um, you know, um, you know, di different susceptible or whatnot. The fact is, all industries are like that. COVID taught us that. When COVID hit, manufacturing had serious supply chain issues that up to this day, have, some of them are still not resolved yet. Agriculture, we had a tropical storm a couple months ago. Almost 70% of the banana industry wiped out. No green figs in the country for nine months. Isn't that a, you know, a fickle industry? But tourism was the one that bounced back the fastest. And tourism and tourists started traveling and the economy revived. If this economy had been dependent on manufacturing, we would not be as well off as we are now. It would not be, because they still have supply chain issues. I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is you need agriculture because you need to feed your people, first and foremost, and you need to supply the tourism industry. Otherwise, all the needs of the tourism industry are imported, which causes economic problems for you, balance of payments and whatever else. So we need to be able to produce in manufacturing. We need to produce the jams, the soaps, the pepper sauce, you know, the chocolates and the sea moss. We need to put those agro-processing um, activities need to be accelerated in the country so it can feed the tourism industry. The tourism industry is the largest consumer of goods and services in the country. 
So you have an outlet. Of course, we still have to export. The similar, with, well, agriculture as well. I mean, the hotels need tomatoes, they need cucumbers, they need peppers, they need all those things. Either we import it or we produce more of it locally. The tourism industry creates that market. It's creating a market for manufacturing and agriculture. So the more the tourism grows and the more they buy from farmers, fishermen, the more they buy from the agro-processors, is the more you see we become more dependent on tourism, if you think about it. But your success in one way, which is creating more avenues for our local producers, is actually increasing our dependence. It grows these other industries, but those industries decide to depend more on it. But just think about during the banana days, when we had a storm or hurricane, and it wipes out the banana crop for nine months, you're suffering. And then you have to start all over again. So, you know, I hear a lot about tourism and whether we should not move to another industry. Any industry you move to, you will have challenges. But for the tourism, what's important for us is that we want more solutions to own the tourism industry, invest. That's why we launched a community tourism program. That's why government will make some announcement in terms of how we provide greater support to St. Lucians, wanting to start off the small business. We want more St. Lucians to own this. This is ours. Why, why do we have the mindset that tourism must be about just hotels and who owns the hotel have to control it? But this is ours. This is our beauty. Uh, and we have to change the mindset of St. Lucians and tell them there are opportunities there. And as a government, we'll help you to exploit those opportunities and create a sustainable livelihood. Any final questions? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. yeah, yeah, so much. You celebrate, I think you know, if you feel a little lighter, one issue has been one particular issue, no more. Which one is that? Uh, customs. Oh, well, I mean, let me tell you. You never really, you know, you know, always, yeah. have you shied away a bit or you just let a lot of process to unfold? Because that is. Let, let me tell you, my, my thinking on it is that. It will never end with the opposition. It will never end. No, no, seriously. I, I've reached that point where I'm super focused on delivering in my constituency and making my ministries work. That doesn't mean I cannot fight. I mean, I have fought five years again, and I know how to fight. And, and when the right time comes, I will fight. But now I'm very focused on what I am doing. Because if you just ch check the history of this thing, it started off saying a vehicle disappeared in the UK, and I stole it, and they said, that obviously that was not true, it was proven not true. They said, oh, um, you brought it and you didn't pay your taxes on it. And when it was revealed that I'm a returning diplomat, I don't have to pay taxes, yet, yes, the VAT has to be paid, but they, they asked to pay the VAT for an affairs on my behalf. They were stopped from doing it. Then now, the later opposition said, okay, it was his, he paid for it, but he gave it back as a gift which is stupidity, really. And then they said, okay, you didn't give an invoice with your name. But so many people buy things overseas for other people and send it on to you. And it's the invoice at Bruns Matter, the invoice at um, Best Buy is not on your name. But we explained to you why it's not on my name. Who oh, arrest him and seize the vehicle. Everybody knew what they were doing. It was a calculated attempt to come after me, to discredit me, calculated. And then now we end up going through the court process. The, the courts um, ask us to go mediation. They changed two controllers to try to get to arrest me. They said they would not do it. They got one who volunteered and said he can get it done. And he did it. Held my head up high, did what I had to do, knowing how it would end up. And then the court ruled that there's no basis for this. They challenged it. And they said, look, they want to appeal. They went to the courts, and the court said there's no basis to appeal against that. And then they start back again with a different version now. Now, what am I going to do? You know, they will keep changing it and changing it and changing it because the objective is very clear. And you saw this thing that's been circulated, like ability report, whatnot. It's very clear. Go after Ernest Hiller and make him appear to be X, Y, and Z. They said, oh, I had a joint account. And like I've said, I've never had a joint account in my life. And I said, no, never had a joint account. I, I've had as a public official to be a signatory on an official government account. When I was permanent secretary, when I was chairman of CIP, and when I was high commissioner, in my official capacity. 
every document related can be shown. And I'm reading a report that is submitted by the leader of opposition saying they could get no documentation. But nobody even asked me if I have documentation. Do you have copies of, of if you investigate an account that you said the high commissioner was responsible for, and you said you went to the high commission and there were no documents, there was an accountant who was running the financial affairs, was he asked for documents? Was he contacted? And if you did not get, could you not have reached out and say, you know, Ernestle, we're trying to get information on this account. Is there any information you can share with us? I will give you all the emails, everything I have. Nobody did. But a report is produced saying they could not get the documentation. I mean, it's ridiculous. But the point is, it will not stop. It will continue, 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 because that's the game plan. Now, what do I do? I can either decide, let's start fighting. You don't want to fight, let's start back fighting. Um, or the time will come when we will have that political contest and we will see what happens. But I, I think, though, um, in having said that, some people might get step over the line and we really have to put a stop to them because you cannot just allow people to say anything about you anytime, any day. It's one thing to be involved in a political contest and people are questioning your decisions on tourism, on je ne all, on jazz, on whether we should host Cricket World Cup and we can respond and one can analyze whether this has impact, whether this is necessary. But when people just saying those things about you and those things go global, and they know it goes global. And if you don't say anything and people are reading every day, he lays a thief, he lays a this, he lays a that, he lays do that. And let me tell you, you just start hearing things. There'll be a lot more to hear. Um, so the time will come. And, and I think that time is going to come very soon. Um, and we'll see what happens. OK, good morning, everybody. Designation, the press secretary would have dealt with that already, but just for purposes of rhythm, I'd like to let you know that I'm Sean Edward, Minister of Education, Sustainable Development, Innovation, Science, Technology, and Vocational Training. And of course, I'm also the duly elected parliamentary representative for the constituency of Denry North, second deputy political leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party, chairman of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, CDIMA. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think it's opportune to inform you that I was out of country for approximately two weeks um, where I attended three high-level meetings. The first one was held in Grenada and there I accompanied Prime Minister Pierre to the second Caribbean Small Islands Developing State High-Level Dialogue on Climate Change and as I said that was held in Grenada. It was a very um, productive meeting. We had no fewer than seven Prime Ministers in attendance. And coming out of this meeting um, was a position by the, the CARICOM, at least those who attended, that ahead of COP28, which, which would be held in Dubai, COP being the Conference of the Parties for the United Nations um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, or what people call UNFCCC, coming out of this meeting, we were able to have a harmonized position. And the point was made repeatedly that instead of going to COP and presenting messages that are at variance with each other from a CARICOM perspective, it is important that we synchronize our messages to accentuate the challenges and difficulties we have dealing with climate change. Climate change is perhaps the single most challenging matter that small island developing states like St. Lucia have to deal with at the moment. And we have seen climate change impact almost every facet of society, almost every sector of national development. When the hurricanes come, and of course we've been told by the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's really a scientific body that does all the monitoring of the climate um, and the different atmospheric conditions to arrive at a conclusion to tell us where we are at as it relates to climate change. And they are saying that the conditions have worsened and resulting from that would be more powerful hurricanes, uh, more severe droughts, and the weather becomes a lot more difficult to predict. And all of those are impacting us, as I said, in very adverse ways. When a hurricane comes in a matter of two hours, it can decimate your, your, your agricultural sector. Um, it can destroy infrastructure. And it can render your country from being, being a thriving one to one where you have zero GDP in the space of two or three hours. 
Uh, I have referenced a weather system which visited St. Lucia uh, just a little over a year ago when we saw a trough which remained stationary over Corinth and the northern half of St. Lucia for just about two hours. And in its wake, we saw cars floating in the streets. We saw appliances exiting homes through windows and doors. And a lot of damage was inflicted on infrastructure and property. That is a real impact of, of climate change. And the point has been made that as small island developing states, we live on the front line of climate change. A farmer in the Mabuya Valley or in Sufre can have a nice little two acre, three acre, acre plot on which he cultivates his, his vegetables and he's able to raise sufficient from that to put books and other materials in his child's school bag. With one weather system, that entire crop can be washed away and can render him um, in a position where he cannot provide for himself and his family. So this is what the whole climate change discourse is about. So we're moving into COP, as I said, with a harmonized position as Caribbean. And we have to continue to push for some of the monies that have been pledged and promised by the developed world, um, where at, at a previous COP, over $100 billion was pledged. Um, that is monies that was supposed to have been um, made accessible by accessible to developing countries. But to date, we notice that that money has not been forthcoming. And when we are impacted by weather systems, we are left with no choice but to borrow. And every one of the Caribbean countries, and Lucia, not an exception, um, we continue to borrow. And sometimes we have to borrow on the brink of credential limits just to ensure that we deal with the adaptation issues that we must um, undertake in, in the face of climate change. So that meeting was held in Grenada, as I said. It was the second Caribbean small island developing state high-level dialogue on climate change. Um, the first one was in the Bahamas um, last year. And so Grenada saw the need to ensure that there was continuity where that is concerned. And this one was extremely critical because it comes on the eve of COP28, which will be held in Dubai. One of the main expectations we have um, for COP28 in Dubai is how will the, the loss and damage fund, which was agreed to in Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt at the last COP, um, how is that fund going to be operationalized? How will it be capitalized? And how will monies be channeled to small island developing states um, through the loss and damage fund? So um, next week, the ministers responsible for climate change of the CARICOM, we will be having yet another meeting again to galvanize our position and to ensure that at least the messages are synchronized and there is coherence in what the Caribbean puts out in Dubai at COP28. Um, if I should just go straight to the, the other meetings that I attended, I also traveled to the Bahamas um, in the last two weeks. Um, for the first meeting, I was representing Prime Minister Pierre. Um, for a climate finance in the Americas meeting. And again, it is just the region, the, the, the Caribbean and Latin American countries, looking for ways to access monies um, at, at very cheap rates to deal with some of the issues that we must attend to as it relates to climate change. That meeting was chaired by the Bahamian Prime Minister in the person of um, PM Philip Davis. And the meeting was held over two days, Sunday the 1st and Monday the 2nd. And I think it was a very, very good meeting. A lot of the um, financial institutions that operate within what we call the LAC, that is the Latin America and Caribbean space, um, made presentations where um, they basically were offering packages um, at concessionary rates that, that countries within the region can borrow to deal with climate change. Um, notwithstanding that all the different institutions give a very good account of themselves, um, from a St. Lucia standpoint, I did raise the issue that, yes, banks operate to make a profit and that banks are looking to lower the interest rates for the loans that they provide. But I wanted to hear more as it relates to grant funding. Because let's face it, we practically, practically have to borrow for a lot of the things that, 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 that we have to undertake in country. A lot of the services we have to provide to our people across sectors, um, sometimes we don't have the capacity to raise the money almost immediately and so we have to borrow. Um, I can tell you that we have done an excellent job in servicing our debt as a country. And we have a very astute Minister of Finance in the person of Prime Minister Pierre, um, who's always on top of the financial situation, situations that confront the country. So 
yes, we have the capacity to borrow, but it cannot be a situation where we will continue to borrow over an extended period of time. That will seriously debilitate the, the, the government and it will put us in a position where we will not be able to deliver on services to our people as we are mandated to um, as an administration. So I did raise the issue of grant funding and the Caribbean, St. Lucia in particular, um, we have to go out there in the international financial space and find where the grant monies are. There are a lot of organizations that, that are willing to work with us, but I, I must tell you that sometimes the, the whole financial architecture that exists can be a bit bureaucratic in, in getting you to actually apply and receive grant fundings. So at that meeting in the Bahamas, as I said, the banks were able to provide a lot of information in terms of what was available or what is available. Um, however, um, notwithstanding that they are making monies available at concessionary rates to us, I believe that there is need for us as ministers, as policymakers, to push a more robust um, discussion as it relates to grant funding. So we had CAF was represented, and CAF is the Development Bank of Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, I think they have some very attractive packages that they presented at the meeting. Our own Caribbean Development Bank was represented, um, and I think the president, um, Hygienus Jean Leon, who is a St. Lucian native, he gave a pretty good account on behalf of the CDB in terms of how the CDB is working with um, member states of the Caribbean to access resources to deal with the whole issue of climate change, whether it's from an adaptation standpoint or a mitigation standpoint. And we had the World Bank um, in attendance as well. And there were a few other agencies that deal with climate financing, although they're not banks, but they too had a presence. And I speak of the Adaptation Fund, I speak of the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, all of them were represented. And as I said, the discussion was a very fruitful one. So it's up to member states to decide if we're going down that road where we continue to borrow, albeit at concessionary rates, or whether as a region we begin to push a more robust discussion um, in relation to grant funding. I believe this is the way to go. Um, we are not responsible for climate change. We know what causes climate change. Climate change is really an offspring of industrialization where you burn fossil fuels and you engage in activities that let off gases in the atmosphere that would cause the temperature of the globe to rise and with that comes a, 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 a situation where a lot of small island states are paying for it whether it's by way of sea level rise whether it's by way of more potent um, atmospheric um, phenomena or whether it's through droughts and we have to live with that we are not the emitters we are not the culprits, but we are the ones suffering the consequences. So when developed countries come and they pledge monies, I think um, it is very unconscionable for them not to put the mechanisms in place to ensure that the monies being pledged um, trickle down to the small island developing states that on a daily basis have to live with the consequences of the actions of people who are in positions where their lot in, in, in life is a lot better than what we can speak to um, as far as our own circumstances are concerned. Question, um, yeah, it, first of all, let's have a question directly on that. Okay. Um, in the aftermath of, of Teachers Appreciation Week, um, I know that, that as a former educator yourself, you will know that, that that job can be a very stressful one. Um, is there anything that the government is putting in place um, to help not just financially the, the teachers but also um, their mental well-being um, in life. Yes, well, you referred to me as a former educator. Oh, Once an educator, always yeah, an educator. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a trained teacher. I have a lot of ex classroom experience, and I would have had a very short stint um, helping out with administration at a particular school, although I was not formally appointed. Um, but today, as the Minister for Education, you would well appreciate that I um very much immersed in the business of education be it at the classroom level i don't know there's any minister of education who has done more school visits than i have so i know what it's like to actually be in that classroom space and i can tell you in the aftermath of covid um, we have had a lot of psychosocial problems at schools and what we've attempted to do is not prove just provide support to the students alone but ancillary staff principals and teachers have received psychosocial support from the Ministry of Education. But as to whether what we have done or we're doing is sufficient, I will be the first to tell you no, there's a lot more we can do. So the intention has always been to work very collaboratively with all the stakeholder agencies, in this case, 
um, the Central Teachers Union and the Principals Association to see how best we can make that working environment conducive for teachers. If teachers are not comfortable, you will not have the kind of impact in the classroom that you want on students. So it has to be a nexus between um, the comfort levels of teachers and the comfort levels of students. And that is the only way you can have an education system that produces what you want. We can stay in the Ministry of Education on the waterfront in our air-conditioned offices and plan our, all we want. We can have the best policies, but if those policies cannot get expression within the classroom space, we basically spin in top in mud. So I appreciate and I understand the need to give teachers all the support they need. And as you quite rightly said, not just um, financial support, but, but psychosocial support. Um, teachers have to constantly be trained. They, have, they, they, they must be retooling because we live in a very dynamic society. And the teacher training that you would have provided 20, 30 years ago, um, I'm certain cannot hold in today's environment. And you have teachers who are technically um, tech, who have a, an appreciation for technology. Um, we have a, we need teachers who better understand the dynamics of society. And as society evolves and you have more challenges, you have to train teachers to ensure that they are able to um, put up and meet um, the daily challenges as they, they, they arise. But that having been said, I'm extremely pleased with the efforts that we get from our teachers and myself, a trained teacher, I've made the point that the real um, expression of gratitude and appreciation for the work of a teacher and can never be measured in terms of dollars and cents. So, but it's important that the salaries are in the bank on time, but we have to go beyond that to say thanks to the hundreds of teachers who leave home on a daily basis um, to mold and shape tomorrow's um, leaders. Just one question in the same thing of education. There have been, um, well, I guess allegations of gang violence making its way into the school, in, well, school institutions on Ireland. Um, is there anything that is being done to curtail this level of violence or gang activity in schools at this time? Yes. Um, it, ha it has to be a multi-pronged approach. It can't just be um, looking at gangs and, and, and gang violence um, in isolation of what obtains in the wider community. At almost every interview where I've had to speak on the issue of school discipline, I've made the point, and I continue to make the point, that the behaviors in the wider society will invariably infiltrate the school system. I believe in the power of example. And if we in society as adults, we exhibit certain behavior traits, children um, as onlookers will look to replicate precisely what they see coming from adults. So yes, we have had incidents where some students have come um, into the school, onto the school compound, exhibiting behaviors that are not in keeping or in conformity with school rules, and behaviors that are not even in conformity with the laws of society. Um, we have had to call the police in on a few occasions to help remedy some situations for very obvious reasons. I'm not going to mention um, some of the schools and some of the incidents we've had to deal with of late. But the one thing I can assure you is that the Ministry of Education will never, under my ministerial watch, hoist a white flag of submission and say that this is beyond us. Um, once the children come to school, we try to meet them on their level and to try and see how best we can encourage them to desist from some of the behaviors that will not augur well for their development, for the reputation of the schools they attend, and for St. Lucia as a, a, a country. But yes, there are challenges. Um, yes, we have had security breaches. Um, yes, we've had situations where children have openly been defiant to teachers and the principals. Um, there are those persons who tell you that the best way to deal with that is to suspend them or expel them. But when you suspend and you expel them, where do you send them to? Are you making the situation better for the country? Are you helping that child? We are all about behavior modification and reformation of character. And if it means that we have to go the extra mile to try and get children to change, we are prepared to do so. But by the same token, children must understand that there are rules that govern um, the school space. And if you're not going to conform with the rules, there are consequences to behavior. I've said to students when I meet them that if they violate the school rules, then they are sent to the principal's office, and that is where they are admonished. When you leave at the end of Form 5 and you violate the rules of, or the laws of society, there's no principal to reprimand you. You have to deal with the consequences of your action by interfacing with the police, the magistrate, and eventually you either get incarcerated or you are fined some money um, for your actions. That is not what we want. School must be more than just teachers imparting content um, for the various subject areas. So it makes absolutely no sense as a society 
that we can have 200 or three, 400 distinctions in mathematics every year. And the same children who can register those impressive grades on national and regional exams um, lack basic skills to coexist with their peers in society. Um, what is the point of you having 10 ones and you cannot resolve basic conflicts with your peers that you have to reach out for a knife or a gun? If it is an education system that only puts out people who are well-trained academically and in com commensurate fashion, you don't have the attitudes and the values to go with the, the impressive qualifications you've registered, our system is failing somewhere. And as minister, I can tell you that um, the one thing that I've been pushing is for, for there to be um, that simultaneous effort where we teach the content, but, but at the same time, we will try to instill values that will make our students um, productive citizens who can coexist with their, their peers. You said it's a multi-pronged approach. Um, what agencies are you guys working with to help with the issue? Yes, we're working very closely with the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. Um, we are working with the Principals Association. We are working with a number of community-based organizations um, in some of the districts. Um, one of the things that we'll be, I'll be speaking to in, in the coming weeks is the formation of this umbrella body where a lot of the retired educators we have in Senegal today, they will be asked to come in and assist us at the community level, um, in particular to see how they can mentor students, mentor teachers, and so on. Because there's a very rich repository of, of talent, of, of experience out there. And yes, people have retired, but there's so much more that they can contribute. And it is my intention as minister to ensure that we formally engage them and to bring them to help. Um, with some of the situations that we have, not just to deal with in discipline, but to also see how we can complement some of the good things um, that we have already been, that we are already doing in the school system. Um, CDEA, I, you would have seen uh, overseas two years of uh, the assessment. Um, comparing it to common entrance, um, has the CPA lived up to the advantages which have been touted um, versus what we have on the common entrance in terms of the stress that is put on the students, um, also the workload for teachers and students, um, the competitions between schools, principals, um, what, what, what um, have you assessed your reports on what has happened from the teachers, from the students, have people been complaining? In my books, um, there's no comparison between the common entrance exam as we knew it and the CPE. That's chalk and cheese, and I would go for CPE any day of the week. The old common entrance exam, as we knew it, a child wakes up in the morning, you get dressed, and you are placed in an examination center. And it doesn't matter what the situation was at home last night. It doesn't matter to anybody whether you had breakfast that particular morning. You go into the exam. Um, and you delete that paper. Just a one-shot exam. And as I said, it doesn't matter if there would have been external factors that impacted your mood or influenced your disposition for the day. You had to take on that exam. And we, have, we would have seen several examples where the scores reflected were not adequate reflections of students' abilities. Okay? With the CPA, there's the internal component and there's the external component. So as the child goes through the primary school system, the child, for want of a better expression, accumulates max, meaning that you have a form of assessment that is continuous. Okay? I believe that is a much better reflection of a child's ability than just the one-shot exam. Teachers have expressed concerns in terms of the workload for the internal component of the CPEA. As I've said before, we do not operate as a command center in the Ministry of Education, where the assessment unit just decides that this is what we're going to do. There has been dialogue, um, there will continue to be dialogue, and if it means that we have to reform certain aspects of the CPE, we are prepared to do so. But we have to be convinced that the level of the Ministry of Education, that whatever changes are being recommended are in keeping with best practice, um, sit well with the original examination body, which is the CXC. But at the end of the day, what we want ultimately is for students, teachers, and parents, and the assessment unit to be happy. There are some schools that go through the process with very little complaint and they are able to register very impressive scores. And there are also some schools where um, 
you get the, the feedback that the, the workload is too burdensome, etc. Um, um, but you must not look at schools <laughs> in isolation. Um, but you must also factor in the fact that the, 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 the dynamic that some schools that come from certain geographic pockets have certain advantages. That's, that's a fact. So the best way to deal with that, as I said, is for there to be ongoing dialogue between the assessment unit of the Ministry of Education and the other stakeholders. But to answer your question, I would opt for the CPE in its current form any day um, before the common entrance exam has been it. Yes, I think, I think yes, I, my, I, I have a very radical position on assessment of students. I think um, it's a little too much. Um, school is supposed to be enjoyed by students. And I think our system, just by its very nature, places too much stress on, on the children. But until such time, we can find an alternative and we can find a form of assessment that, that would be uh, more in keeping in modern day um, small island societies, I think we have to continue to soldier on with what we have. But I too recognize that in certain parts of the world, of course, you can't compare um, given the amount of resources they have and the structures that they're deploying as far as their own education system is concerned, that children are not even subjected to um, assessment as we know it in, in our part. So yes, I agree with you that it is something that, that we have to revisit. And I'm just hoping that all the exams that we subject our children to um, we can probably find an alternative to those and to see how we can nurture um, tomorrow's leaders in ways that are more in keeping with modern day society. Um, I know your ministry, um, I think it was this year, um, there was the launching of the, 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 Mandarin, uh, the Mandarin program. Um, how, is, how is that program, or how are you guys working to have that program work in tandem with the Taiwanese scholarship program? Because in many of these instances, when um, when the recipients you know, get the scholarship, they actually have to spend a year learning the language um, in Taiwan. So how are you guys working to maybe marry that program with the scholarship program? And, and what do you say to the, the critics who might, um, who have criticized the ministry for piloting Mandarin before? Um... Right, well, um, let me say that the, the objective of the Mandarin program, it's a pilot program at the St. Joseph's Convent and the, the St. Mary's College. And I must tell you that I was, um, in the audience when the children give a demonstration of their, their aptitude um, in Mandarin. And for a moment, if I had closed my eyes, I would have thought that I was somewhere in Taipei. Um, and they were very fluent, and they've demonstrated good grasp and command of that language. You see, we live in a society today where you can't prepare young people to exist only in St. Lucia. Um, so the Prime Minister himself is on the record as stating that he wants the average child in St. Lucia to be able to speak three languages. Um, by the time he or she graduates through our school system. Um, so the Mandarin was a pilot. It was completely funded by the Taiwanese um, embassy. But as I said, it is not a prerequisite for one to qualify for a Taiwanese scholarship. But if you apply for a Taiwanese scholarship and you would have been exposed to the rudiments of Mandarin at an early age, it gives you an advantage. Um, China is one of the biggest... Um, countries in the world, not in terms of the demographics, the population, but trade and, and, and things of that sort. And the Chinese are everywhere in the world and they speak Mandarin. Um, so if our students are able to speak Mandarin, I think it gives them a bit of an advantage. But the, the, the piloting of the Taiwanese, the Mandarin, sorry, um, spearheaded by the Taiwanese embassy is not in any way whatsoever um, making it mandatory for, for our students to learn Mandarin as a prerequisite to gain scholarships um, in Taiwan. For Creole, yes, um, a lot of work has been done to, to teach Creole in our schools. We will be starting very shortly with quite a few schools. Um, and I must tell you that, that the ministry is under a tremendous amount of pressure to introduce formal Creole um, speaking classes in the schools because in today's generation, even in rural St. Lucia, where you speak to, in rural St. Lucia, where you speak to, to um, the average five and seven year old, and he or she is not able to respond in Creole. And I must also tell you that in some of the schools in the, the urban areas, um, the parents have been clamoring for the introduction of Creole um, in those schools. So through our modern languages um, curriculum officer, at Kamdu, 
uh, I know they're at a very advanced stage in, in finalizing the curriculum um, that will speak to the teaching of Creole in our schools. We will not do it across the board at once. We will obviously pilot it in a few schools. And as I said, it is in keeping with um, the thinking of our administration where our children have to be multilingual. And again, I have to say that we are not preparing them only for life in St. Lucia, um, but life beyond the shores of our country. Thank you very much. Um, gentlemen and ladies, good morning. As you know, we visited Venezuela last week, Friday, for a one-day visit. Accompanying me was the senior minister and the minister for infrastructure, etc., and the minister of external affairs. Um, before we tell you what transpired, I don't know whether you have any questions that you want to ask me before we do that. Well, I, on that topic or separate? Separate. Separate. Well, separate, obviously. Big announcement coming out of the well, your office over the weekend was the inclusion of the um, san the sanitary napkins officially being part of the price control items. I don't know if. You want to yes, twenty foot from the twenty foot of October, we we have we decided that the cabinet decided that some t some types of of sanitary um, gear will be on the price control, basically to ensure that there is fairness and then the government and the benefits of removal of VAT is felt by the public generally. Because we actually remove the VAT from, from, from these items, also building materials. That doesn't seem to make in, make in the news that VAT was actually removed on these items and the cost of these items have, have reduced and it, it, um, that hasn't seemed to be making the news. But we want to remind the solutions that the VAT on building materials was removed, actually removed, taken out. So building materials would cost 12.5% cheaper than any than any time building materials are imported, regardless of the cost, the price will be 12.5% cheaper. And, and I can tell you that that has created some level of increased activity. And from what I'm hearing, the Christmas season, in terms of people doing, doing renovations to their homes, there is going to be, there is going to be uh, the effect of the removal of VAT on building materials is going to be felt. I've, I've been told so, the science are there, and people are very excited about the, the removal of VAT on building materials. Hence the same the removal of VAT on these on 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 some levels some types of sanitary equipment the vat but to ensure since these items are very important we've put them on the price control we haven't done so for building materials but we put them on the price control and also and let me also tell you again that there is no health and security levy on food there is no health and security levy on any goods that were vatable once there was no VAT, there is no health and security levy on it. Once VAT was zero rated, there is no health and security levy on it. There is no health and security levy on charcoal unless it's imported. I want to know how many of you import walking sticks. If you can tell me the amount of people who import walking sticks, I'll be very, very happy. Please, I'm putting out a question. How many people import walking sticks to the country? So if you can tell me. How many people import walking sticks? I'm going to be very, very, very and I'll, I'll, I'll remove it. If you tell me that walking sticks is an essential, is, is an essential thing that causes the cost of living to increase, walking sticks, tell me I'll remove, I'll remove the housing security levy. I'm, put, I'm saying an open challenge to, to members of the press to inform the Minister of Finance how many walking sticks are imported in St. Lucia every month, every year. And if that creates such a problem for the country, I will remove the heaven security all walking sticks. Please, I'm giving you that, I'm asking you that job for me, free of charge, I hope you, you take, because you're the ones who have been, who have been making, who have been um, talking about walking sticks. So I want to ask the question, okay? Over the weekend, um, Israel 
um, declaring a war on Palestine um, already. We have already seen um, the prices of um, oil on the international market for it. We know this has been a concern, you know, for us, I mean, with what has happened with the Ukraine, Russia war and whatnot. Um, I know your the government has been subsidizing um, well, fuel products. Um, your thoughts on this and what this could mean for our country moving forward and if also to a message to our people in terms of what they could look forward to with this war. Well, if you heard my latest UN address, well, I, I made the, the call for that there's, there ought to be some level of, of, of understanding of the situation in that, and in that part of the world. Um, we, we do not know how far that war will, will, will escalate. Um, it's early days still, um, but the price of oil on the world market has already begun to show signs of increasing. Um, the last week, we, we were subsidizing coke and gas in excess of $20. So we are keeping our fingers crossed. As you know, we have absolutely no control over the, the, the price of, of oil on, on the world market, but we hope the war in, 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 in Ukraine is, is, is raging along. Now we have, the, we have that instability in the Middle East, in, in, in the Middle East, in the East. So we are keeping our fingers crossed. We can't make any predictions, but we're hoping that the situation doesn't escalate and other parties do not join and create unnecessary problems. So because, because we are the ones who, who are going to suffer in the final analysis. The small islands always suffer. So you've taken the walking six assignment? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> take, I want you to take the walking six assignment. I want you to go to the customs and find out how many walking sticks we import, how much charcoal we import, and how come that causes such a... So such why a, that's my assignment? Why, huh? why, that's my, why isn't that my assignment? Why anybody else No, no, everybody is <laughs> open. <laughs> the assignment is open. Anybody can, can take the assignment. You know, I've just thrown it out because, you know, I just want to find out what... what the impact of of two point two point five or walking sticks, the impact it has on on the economy. I, I don't want to preempt anything, um, but still talking about fuel and petroleum and whatnot. I know Venezuela is a producer. Is there anything? Venezuela is a. Uh, yes, we'll we'll hear from us. We'll hear from us about. Anyhow, Venezuela. <clears throat> on Friday, the Minister of External Affairs, the Senior Minister, and I um, were on a trip to Venezuela. This is nothing new. St. Lucia has had diplomatic relations with Venezuela from 1979. In fact, the first state visit to Venezuela was done by Sir John Compton when he was then Prime Minister. In 1979, he visited uh, Venezuela. St. Lucia has continued to maintain these relations with Venezuela from, from that time. Venezuela has been an ally to, to St. Lucia. And we did, did, there was a small break in relations between Sanusha and Venezuela for a short period um, between the, in the years 2020, Minister, the break of relations with Venezuela, when they, when, all right, 2020, when there was a break in the former administration, when the ambassador, when Venezuela, there was um, an ambassador designate to Venezuela and the former administration refused to accept her, her uh, uh, credentials, which cause, uh, which cause a, a, a lot of shame on it in the international international world. An ambassador in Saint Lucia, and the government refuses to accept her her credentials. That is unheard of, and the minister of of, of external affairs will tell you what mark that did on the country. So we reestablish these relations, and the ambassador. The ambassador was accepted. The credentials of the ambassador were accepted, and from that time we've been establishing. We have been working with with Venezuela to establish, to confirm, and to strengthen these uh, relations. Um, we it was a very successful visit. There are some direct benefits that are going to accrue almost immediately. We have a, a, a phone call a Zoom meeting at 1.30 today with officials of, in Venezuela to discuss 
So how St. Lucia can get fertilizer for its farmers, can get um, housing, and we, we'll expand further by, by my colleagues, housing assistance, fertilizer for farmers. The, the fertilizer should be here by next month for the farmers of, of the country. We spoke, we dealt with infrastructure, for material, for road construction. So there were some tangible benefits. We, we signed an air services agreement and we are expecting some results very, very soon. In fact, I think the fertilizer should be here by the end of November, if, if not sooner. It's, it, it's nothing new. We reiterated our position that I think the sanctions against Venezuela should be removed. That is nothing new. We said so in the, in, the, in, in the UN last year. We said so in the UN this year. Um, it's, our, it's our position that St. Lucia has a right to be friends with whoever we want. We are friends with Taiwan. We are the only two countries in the, in the in, we are the, one of the three countries in the OECS that have relations with Taiwan. So we have we reserve the right. So when I say we reserve the right to have friends with who you want, I mean it. So we are friends with Taiwan. So um, it's, it's nothing new. Uh, um, so we we are very proud of our relationship with Venezuela, and we'll continue to make the call that the sanctions be removed. It was a call that I made publicly in the UN last year and this year. We think the sanctions are unjust, and I think the people of Venezuela should be allowed to plot their own affairs, like the people of Taiwan. And again, that's a point we've made all the time, that we do not interfere in the internal affairs of any country. We don't interfere in the internal affairs of, of Taiwan, we don't interfere in the internal affairs of Venezuela. So um, it is nothing new, but we're very, very happy you went, and my colleagues will give you some more information. Ms. Axel Affairs. Good morning, everyone. It's not very often that I am clothed with, with that important trust of addressing you. But uh, this morning, I want to join Prime Minister in sharing you know, our own impressions of our last visit to Venezuela. I think as Prime Minister indicated, he led our very first bilateral um, meeting um, to Venezuela. It was a very productive meeting, very useful discourse. We met with the Foreign Minister of Venezuela, the Minister for Transport, Minister for Tourism, Minister for Agriculture, as well as the Minister for Public Policy. Apart from the Vice President, of the Republic, as well as President Maduro himself. I think we agreed to cooperate on a multiplicity of levels, um, including agriculture, education, you know, in the area of energy, and improve the connectivity between our two countries. And we proceeded to sign an MOU to cooperate in those very clear and practical areas that will impact positively on our country. We also signed a clear roadmap to how we can actually deal with the air services agreement that will facilitate the Venezuelan carrier to operate in our jurisdiction. It will create an improved framework for both tourism and trade between Venezuela and St. Lucia. As a matter of fact, many years ago we had Rent Avion, you know, taking speculators from St. Lucia across to Margarita and back. So this is nothing new. I think we are going to, to start a new engagement for trade and, and cooperating on a fundamentally different level. So our visit, really and truly, was to ensure that we create an improved framework for our country to match our basic need with greater possibilities. So undoubtedly, it was a one-day meeting that covered a lot of ground. And like Prime Minister said, fertilizer um, for our farmers. That's quite important. You know, coming out of the COVID-19 period and still recovering, obviously, during that period, people would have been really anxious and restless. A number of people lost their jobs during that time. A number of farmers did not have the financial resources to actually purchase a lot of fertilizer for us to recover. We found an economy in a mess. 
It plunged um, into a major recession prior to COVID and compounded during COVID, a contraction of 24.4%. But when Honorable Philip J. Pierre came into office, we could not have ignored the fact that the conflicts that were rooted in unemployment, poverty, and of course crime had been exacerbated by the COVID-19 situation. And so we are in a hurry to return this country to normalcy, to rebuild the economy of the country, to deliver greater services um, to the people of the country. And therefore, our trip to Venezuela is part of that effort to ensure that we return that, that economy to normalcy with lightning rapidity. I want to just have you here, um, separate from the Venezuela um, visit, um, last month was a very active month for you um, at the UN General Assembly. We signed a few diplomatic relations. I think there was also a visa, a visa waiver agreement signed with Indonesia. So if you could just expound on um, those things that occurred over the past um, month. Certainly. Um, in keeping, again, with our efforts at creating that improved framework for us to match our basic need with greater possibilities, we are trying to engage with non-traditional countries. We shall continue to strengthen our relations with our traditional friends like the US, Canada, and, and the UK. And, of course, we are not weakening our relations. We are not turning away from the old, as uh, the late president um, JFK said, but we are turning toward the new because our people are demanding more attention. But we are a small, open, and vulnerable economy, and there are only so much that we can do. So we are aligning ourselves with persons who are going to assist us in developing the country. And Africa is an area that we must engage with, um, Asia, and so you would see activity in that regard you know, trying to, to cure the deficit in terms of the number of countries that we do not currently have bilateral relations with. So again, we are reaching into new areas, all in an effort to give the people of this country the best possible results in terms of our government managing a very, very vulnerable economy at this juncture in time. Um, since the establishment of, I guess, relations or the strengthening of relations between the African Union and the well, CARICOM, what would you say um, since then has been, I, I guess, one of the biggest benefits so far in just establishing that? that um... You know, the, the thing about establishing relations, there is a long gestation period before it actually gives birth to results. But only recently the Ministry of Finance went to Barbados in that bank. The Africans are endeavoring to offer us a facility where we can tap into resources for the development of our respective jurisdiction. So I would say this is one of the benefits. However, you know, when you establish diplomatic relations with a country, especially new countries, you must build that relationship. You must be aligned on a multiplicity of levels. You must, you must ensure that your strategic priorities are not in conflict with theirs because you need to cooperate on the basis of mutual trust and respect. And this is why we are building those relations on the basis of what would impact positively on the people of our country and the people of their own countries. But bear in mind, there is that long gestation period before it actually gives birth to that type of result. Trust must be built, you know, then, you know, engagements that are necessary, we, we must pursue those avenues via patient endeavor. That is what we almost always do. We must be very patient, strategic. You must use the right tactics to ensure that you succeed in that mission. Yes? Thank you very much and good morning to all of you for the opportunity given to address you today following the state visit to Venezuela under the guidance and leadership of our Prime Minister, the Honorable Philip J. Pierre. I must in a nutshell indicate that it was a very intense day of positive discussions with the Venezuelan officials 
and we're able to discuss the spectrum of initiatives and also address matters of concern to St. Lucia. You've heard from the Prime Minister and you've heard from the Minister for External Affairs. From my end, as Minister responsible for infrastructure ports, transport, physical development and urban renewal, my focus mainly was on infrastructure, road infrastructure. And so an appeal was made to the Venezuelan authorities who received it positively and agreed to collaborate with us to see how they can assist us in our road infrastructure. In that regard, we have made an appeal for consideration of bitumen. Bitumen is an element uh, used in the production of asphalt. And they have gone even further, not only to commit themselves to the provision of bitumen uh, in the, for the production of asphalt, but also to provide, if necessary, granular material for that purpose, which would mean that if we're able to receive this benefit from the Venezuelans, then it means road construction will see some level of uh, depreciation in terms of cost. The cost of road construction will be decreased. In addition, it means that even the private sector will benefit. So a number of the private contractors who engage in road construction will also be able to benefit by the provision of the bitumen to St. Lucia. Another area which was also discussed is the area of energy. And energy, as you're aware of, uh, energy for us in St. Lucia for the past years, we have been pursuing the initiative of energy. And we're on the verge now of, um, of cabinet considering what we call the national energy policy and to renew that policy and update it in preparation for what is on the landscape. What is most visible on the landscape is that of the, the Electricity Supply Act, the new Electricity Supply Act, which will enhance the environment for participation, not only by one power producing company, but several independent power producing companies, be it in solar, in wind, uh, geothermal, or ocean tech, or any other form of energy that they can participate in the production of electricity for domestic and commercial use, and at the same time to be able to participate in the distribution through the sale and buyback of electricity on the main grid, which is owned by uh, Luslec. So we are at a point where we can work with the Venezuelans in terms of fuel, in terms of fuel, um, fuel products, oil products, bitumen, which will assist us in our road infrastructure and at the same time assist us and collaborate with us on the issue of energy. We also made a pitch for housing, and the government is very concerned about housing, the cost of housing, be it rental or purchase, and our initiative was really intended to see how best we can get from Venezuela assistance in identifying low-cost housing, particularly social housing, for St. Lucia. They have been able to come up with a product in housing that they believe will assist us. Many years ago, we were able to get assistance from Venezuela in green art housing. On this occasion, they've got a product which emanates from oil, and it is non-flammable, hurricane-resistant, it is one that we believe will work. And today, as the PM indicated, we are having our first meeting, and that shows the interest that Venezuela is showing. Today at 1.30, we'll have a, the, a technical meeting with the Venezuelan officials to try and streamline and tie in those uh, initiatives for the good of St. Lucia. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. yes. There's a consistent strike going on on the Kovisak Road. Um, any, any, anything from you considering that? Yeah, the, the, the workers are on strike. There is some dispute between the employer and employees on that project. Um, there seem to be an issue of cash flow. What I can tell you is that the last request made by the contractor for payment 
the government has fulfilled its responsibility and our responsibility is based on the certification of the contractor on the job that is uh, the um, consultant contractor on the job and whereas there were some issues relating to that that has been settled out and the contractor should have received his money last week so i believe that this would have resolved whatever issues that may be hovering in the air okay thank you very much